out most to me is when Christ told John to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And the things that John saw were those characteristics of Christ listed uh, earlier on that we just went over in the first chapter of Revelation. And so uh, Christ kind of gives us an outline already in this text. And, and, and as we open this text, this, this is the outline that Christ gives. Christ says this is a three-point sermon. This is a three-part message. And those three parts are write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after. And that's exactly how this entire book is unraveled. Now, there's many subpoints and subparts, but for the most part, there's three major attacks here in the Scripture uh, towards the heart of man. And so um, the things which are is what we read about in chapter 1, what we've already studied. And it represents uh, the vision in John on the island of Patmos. And then the things... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that write the things which you have seen, which was chapter 1, and then you see the things which are is represented in chapter 2 and 3. That is the church age. And the church age is something that we live in right now, and it's, uh, that's the study where we looked at the seven different churches in Asia Minor, and uh, that's where we spent the last several weeks discussing the different churches and, and uh, what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong, all the way down to the church that could do no right and the door was ultimately shut to that church, locking the Lord outside. And, and so this is the current age that we live in now. We live in the church age. And if you were to look around this community and see all the various churches that line the inner city streets, I imagine it would be very similar to what John was looking at whenever he would look across his communities. He would see all these churches, and, uh, and it wasn't just the seven churches that we hear about here, but there were many churches at that time that Christianity was taking off and, 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 and it would be similar to the, the same kind of spectacle that we have now. We have churches mingled in with regular, you know, worldly uh, things and secular living. And so it'd be very similar. And so we're in that same church age right now that John wrote about in chapters 2 and 3. And since little has changed since then, there's still a call for churches to present themselves better. Churches still need to repent from their heretical teaching. Churches still need to rebuke the apostates uh, that bring a false gospel. Uh, and there's always work to do in the church. The church is always having to get better. Uh, there's no perfect church. And so um, the, the, the message of the church era is still important. It's still relevant. And we're not moving away from that message, but we're looking at the things which will take place after this, which is the third and final subject throughout the book of Revelation. And so we're going to be looking at it from that aspect. This is the future things, the mystery of the gospel. And so before Christ came in the flesh and was born of a virgin, he was a mystery. He himself was a mystery. And people didn't know who the Messiah was, who he looked like, how he would come, what he would do when he got here. And so he revealed himself in the flesh and he showed them exactly who he was and, and all that. And so what Christ is doing here now in this text is he is revealing to us those prophetic happenings of the future. And, he is an exp and we're going to do our best to, to translate and to understand uh, uh, the complete revelation of Christ, but some of these things are still going to be a mystery <laughs> because they're still yet to come. And, and they're called mysteries is because we don't have a full understanding of what it is that Christ is trying to tell us because he hasn't fully revealed to us every little thing that must take place in order... Uh, uh, for all these things to come in and, uh, and happen to us. And so uh, the last church we studied was the church at Laodicea. Do you remember the nickname for this church? You're neither hot nor cold. The lukewarm church. And so I find it interesting that as we close the era known as the church age, uh, Christ says that he stands at the door and it was shut, right? said, you have shut me out. But the very first verses that we open chapter 4 to is about a door that's standing wide open to heaven. And so I think that's an interesting thing uh, that we should, should keep in, uh, kind of in grasp as we run through this text. And, and so what, what we have here is, is, is the last church in that sequence of the church age has fully closed Christ out of the church. And as we go into chapter 4, we see the door standing wide open to heaven for who? 
Who is the person that is standing before that door? John. Yeah, a Christian standing right before the door. John is standing before the door of heaven, which is wide open. And so Christ, he gave, he gave us the outline of this book of Revelation. He did so in a three-pronged approach. We are now in the time where Christ asked John to write about the things which take place after this. And so after this would be meaning after the church age, after the church had fully shut the door on Christ, after the church could do no more good, after the church was no more valuable, after the church was no more doing its duty as a Christian organization, as a Christian institution, and so they, they have locked Christ out at that moment is when Christ is going to open the door, when that last soul gets saved, when that last conversion is made, when the, when the world has had their complete opportunity, when all that could be won has won, when the last movable soul is moved, and when the Lord has finally fulfilled His commitment to be long-suffering. And that is a moment when the church doors' hearts are completely shut to God and they don't want to preach or teach the gospel anymore. So let's look at the first verse in this series and break down the transition from not uh, just the church age, but also transcending, uh, uh, also the transcending of John into the throne room of God in heaven. And so we're going to look all of verse 1 today. I hope y'all have time. We're going to try and get all the way through verse 1 today. Do we have enough time, Tom, to make it through one verse, sir? I don't think so. We might have to take this into two or three weeks. I'm just kidding. And so let's read verse 1 together. Uh, behold, I stand at the, uh, behold, a door standing open. And so after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you the things which must take place after this. Father, we thank you for this text, and we thank you for your scripture. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon our reading of it, and we pray that you bless us with understanding, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Revelation has been a tough study for many scholars. I've mentioned before that there are some very popular theologians who just refuse to expound the scriptures of Revelations because it is, it's full of a lot of pictography and, and a lot of imagery and there's a lot of shocking and bizarre things that are going on and there's so much that you could get wrong or you can look at wrong and there's so much to... to and, and, you know, I would say this about people who are afraid to get into the book of Revelation. I'd say, well, why aren't you afraid of the rest of the Scripture the same way? Because we shouldn't get any of Scripture wrong, not to mention the book of Revelations. And so we shouldn't avoid one book or one chapter over another because it's all equally valuable and it's all equally important. And just as, uh, uh, as it says in Revelations that we shouldn't add to or take away from the book because, you know, we'll bring judgment upon ourselves. But it means it about the entire Bible. And so I want us to get into this book and I don't want us to be afraid of looking at some of these bizarre things and trying to understand what Christ is really saying to the church and what he's really saying to us. And so as we open this first verse, the, the, the first three words of this verse serve me as a reminder that Christ does not wish for me to get lost in this study right because we got his outline and in his outline he said write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this and so when we open chapter 4 which is the third and final point in Christ's message to us it says after these things the the those things which will take place after this and so he's telling us hey we're picking up the new chapter and so it kind of serves as bookends for this section of Scripture. And as mentioned before, uh, that Christ gave us the outline, and he talked about chapter 1 and the, and the things that are seen, chapter 2 and 3, that the things that are currently are, and 4 through 19 will cover the things that will be. And, and these three words closes the door on the church age in the same way Christ said it would in his outline. And I love how God takes special care in giving me the clues I need in understanding the path forward when reading his holy word. And so Christ is navigating us already in this book. He's already telling us, okay, we have moved on from one topic and we're moving on to the next topic. It's important that an educator doesn't lose his listeners, right? And you don't want people to get lost in the lesson. And so Christ does a good job touching down with us and telling us after these things, John, this is John speaking. He said, I looked and behold a door 
standing open in heaven. And so there's a significant event, though, that takes place between chapter 3, 22, and chapter 4 in verse 1. Does anybody know what's significant that has taken place between 3.22 and 4.1? Do what? Yes. What, Tom? The rapture. The rapture. And so something I find very interesting is, is how fast does the rapture happen? Not in the blink of an eye, but the twinkling of an eye, which is as fast as vision can receive a sight. And so it takes longer to blink than it does to recognize an object. And so from verse 3.22 to 4.1, I see a twinkling of the eye. <laughs> the rapture took place. And so Revelation does not talk about it here. But there is a pocket of time in between these two verses from chapter 3 to chapter 4. And this is the place where pre-tribulationists find their departure. And I find myself in the category of pre-tribulationists, and I have a few reasons for such a belief system, and I'd like to use the outline of Revelation to make my first point. Some people believe that, okay, some of you know this, some of you don't. Pre-tribulation is somebody who believes before God brings seven years of judgment on the earth, you're going to be raptured. Mid-trips believe that about three and a half years into the tribulation period, into the judgments of God, you're going to be raptured. And post-tribs believe that you're going to have to make it all the way through tribulation before Christ calls his beautiful bride home. And so I have an argument that I want to make for pre-tribulationism. And I believe that pre-tribulation is, is, is exactly what's going to happen. Now, I'm not saying that right before tribulations, things aren't going to be very bad. I think they will be very bad because the text does tell us how the wind-up. The wars and the rumors of wars and the famines and all the things that are going to come over the earth before tribulation happens. Matthew 24 does a good job describing all of the events that lead up to the actual tribulation. And so I find it interesting that until this moment in our study of this book, the church has been a central theme in character. And so the first reason that I believe will be pre-tribulationists -tribu uh, is because of the disappearance of the church age in relation to Revelation. And so the church has been a central theme, right? What did we talk about in all of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3? There were seven of them. I'll give you a hint. The churches. The churches. It was all that was important in chapter seven and or chapter 2 and chapter 3. What about chapter 1? Who was chapter 1 about? About Christ standing in front of the seven... Golden lampstands, which were the churches, about Christ governing his beautiful church. It was about his eyes watching. It was about his feet prepared to stamp out any problems. It was about his, uh, he had a golden sash. He was the, the holy priesthood over those seven churches. It was about his, uh, his gown that stretched all the way to the floor showing his royalty and, and, his, and his, his reign over the churches and everything in the characters, that, the, the characteristics of Christ and what he was wearing represented his position over the churches as he stood behind those seven golden lampstands. And so the first three chapters are all about the church. But what I find interesting is we move forward in the study, we'll not hear about her again until chapter 19 before we hear about the marriage supper of the Lamb, before we hear about the bride of Christ. And I think this is a good start, but it's not the only reason why I believe that we will be raptured pre-tribulation. I believe it's a good start, and it's a good point uh, to emphasize. And the second reason I believe is the appearance of the apostate. And so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you can write that down. You can do some research later. But we read about a church that believed they were in the Great Tribulation period. There are those who believe we're actually in the millennial reign now. And so I don't find it bizarre that this church believed that they were actually in the Great Tribulation period. And so uh, they, they gave it a special name in this scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And they called it as the Day of Christ. And so when you see the Day of the Lord or you see the Day of Christ in scripture, it's talking about... The tribulation period, the day in which he will bring his wrath and judgment upon the earth. And so Paul warned them, though, when they were afraid, they said, we're in tribulation. At this time, it was rough on these guys. Don't get me wrong. And, and you know, to the Holocaust, to the Jews, that was like a tribulation period. I don't want to argue with them, but it is not the great tribulation. 
It is not the most offensive and atrocious and horrific event that the world will ever be a part of. It'll be worse than the flood. It'll be worse than what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. This great tribulation be unlike anything the world has ever experienced at all. And so Paul, he admonishes them. He says, let, let not one of you be deceived, any of you by any means, for that day, and in my Bible, the letter D is capitalized, because it is a different day than any other day. And it says, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, and the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, and that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so a, a particular verse of scripture here that many people glance over, and they don't take enough time to really understand, they don't really want to dig into, is, is where it talks about the falling away. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And so that falling away is that rapture, is that glorious calling, Jesus Christ calling his children to come home to him. That And, and, and there's many uh, other texts and other translations that give a better explanation of the falling away, but basically what it means is, is the glorious taking away of God's people, the falling away. There will be a certain half of population that will disappear, or a fraction, should I say, before that day, the great day of tribulation. And so then the scripture goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians that the man of sin will be revealed, and this is the prince of the power of the air taking full control of earthly endeavors in the form of the, or at least in the form of Antichrist or many Antichrists in a lot of instances. But there will be the Antichrist be revealed. And so we will be raptured prior to those events, to the day of the Lord and the great reign of this wicked one. And so there's also, you know, God has his DNA in nature and in the world, and he has his DNA in this holy book. And we can look at this book as a whole, and we get a good idea of how God communicates to us his plan for the world, his plan for things, and those things are called types. And so the third reason, I have an Old Testament type. This is the type in which God speaks to us using the Old Testament. And this is why I believe that God's people, his church, will not go through the Great Tribulation physically. And so, through these illustrations that I'm going to bring forward to you just right now, I believe I can help you to understand the way God kind of operates. And many of you know these stories, and y'all you, have heard these stories, but maybe you haven't heard them this way as it pertains to the end times. And so, I have here, uh, I believe it's Matthew, I didn't make my notes good. And now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, and so Jesus is standing before the Pharisees and he's standing before a great, God, great crowd and they're questioning him, when is, the, when, is the, when is tribulation coming? When, are you, when is your millennial reign going to come? When are all these things going to take place that says this is the end times? And, and, and so they, they're, they're kind of quizzing him and they're trying to ask him and they're really trying to put the pressure on Jesus into... Uh, giving them a day and an hour. And I want you to know that's common today. People are constantly trying to pressure God into giving him the day that he's going to return. <laughs> they're going to the Word of God and they're trying to put together timelines and events and they're really trying to hammer down the exact day that Christ is coming. And we know from looking at uh, the seven churches that that day is not mentioned and it's not going to be mentioned because a thief doesn't tell you when he's coming. And Christ is going to come like a thief in the night trying to catch those unaware before he takes his jewels and his pearls and his gems back to heaven with him. And so as it gets down into our, uh, into our text, into uh, verse 26, I want to quote for you. And as it was, this, he's talking about the end times. He goes, this is the way it will be on that great day, on the day of the Lord. It was as though it were the days of Noah. So it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, and they sold, they planted, they built. But 
on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. And I tell you, in, in that night there will be two men in one bed, and one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together, the one will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken and the other will be left. And so we have here the unraveling of that moment, of the rapture. What's it going to be like at the moment of the rapture? And so let's think about the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, there was a world full of wickedness. How many people were saved? Eight. Millions and millions of people in the world had gotten so wicked that only eight people were found righteous in God's eyes. And so the world continued in their normal drunken revelries into their sinfulness as God's elect toiled in righteous obedience. They sat there and they worked hard to build an ark. you got to imagine people... Walking past this ark, they're drinking, they're having a good time, they're mocking Noah. He's spending all of his money doing what God asked him to do, right? At the end of the day, he wasn't just building an ark. He was obeying God. And that's a pretty big deal. That is, that is the biggest deal, that God told him to do something, and they obeyed. God was also telling the community to do something, too, that they needed to repent and they needed to come to Christ. And if they had done that, maybe they'd have been a part of the ark building. Maybe they would have got, been able to be on the ark. But they didn't. And so as the thief comes, that's what he's looking for. When those walk past, ignoring the few righteous, those who are calling out for the salvation of others and the repentance of people. And, and, and so as, the, as, as Noah and his family toiled in righteous obedience the thief in the night god he snatched the boat off of the land and he elevated it closer to heaven than any other vessel had gone pushing the rest of them to as far away from heaven as they could get the bottom of the ocean and so christ he come and he and he and, and he raised noah up kind of like a rapture event right and, 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 and that's what the church's response. They, they, how does that pertain to us? How are we like Noah? It is our job to toil obediently after the great work of God, trying to preach repentance, trying to lead people to the ark, which is Christ, trying to lead those to salvation. And the world will continue to get worse and worse in their reveries and their drunken orgies and their, and their defilement. And they will continue to fall after their lusts and their desires just like they did in the days of Noah. But I've got one a little bit further for you. Who knows who Enoch is? Anybody know who Enoch is? Enoch. How did Enoch? Yeah, Enoch uh, walked on this earth as God. Oh, I'm sorry, with God. And he was not. Yeah, and he was not God. <laughs> how did he, he God. and how, where did he go? How did he leave? With God. <laughs> he ascended. He ascended. Ladies and gentlemen, the very first rapture. <laughs> the very first rapture recorded in the Holy Bible was Enoch. And uh, he escaped death. Uh, was it Noah's? Yeah. Great, great, great grandfather, if I remember correctly. Three greats. I'm, 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 it might be four, but it's at least three I know, greats. I know Noah's a descendant. Yes, uh, yep, and it's three grand, might be four great grandfathers, but for sure at least three uh, great grandfathers up the chain, and and uh, and he was caught up in a chariot of fire into heaven. He had a one way ticket to heaven. And he had enough righteousness in him to get him there that Christ covered him and carried him under his wings and, and provided for him the righteousness to get before God. And we had the very first rapture represented in Scripture. And so I want us to think about the story of Noah now a little different. And so maybe Enoch represents the rapture of those faithful. And Noah and his family are the elect after tribulation maybe those are the jewish heritage the few the remnant because i want you to know the whole point of the revelation story 
is so that God can keep his promise to Abraham and Isaac to give them until the end of the earth to make a turning, to come back to Christ, to return. He, he's there for the Jews, and, it, and it's awful that he has to bring such judgment and tribulation upon the earth before their stony hearts are beaten into enough submission to where they will turn and, and, and worship Christ as the Lord and Savior. And so as I, as I was thinking about Noah and as I was doing my research into this thing, I can't help but think about Enoch. Maybe that's representation of the church and the rapture, and maybe that that noble, uh, righteous family that, that was on the boat. You know, we hear later on, we're going to hear about the 144,000 faithful that are left. 144,000 Jews will be a part of this tribulation period. And the, and, and the scripture gives them great commendations. Matter of fact, there were 144,000 men, and it said not one of them had ever told a lie. If that was all they did in their life, that would be unbelievably amazing, <laughs> is to go their whole life without telling one lie. But these will be powerful Jews who speak the words of truth and who will woo the rest of their brothers and sisters that are wooable into a faithful, loving, and adoring relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I kind of think about the scripture that way. And that, that's just one little fingerprint of God and what things will be like as we approach the rapture event, as we approach the, the tribulation period, and it come by Jesus. He said, think of Noah. But there's also someone else that he talked about. He said, consider Lot. I want you to think about Lot for just a minute, right? He, he made some very bad decisions. And uh, I know that uh, I'm, I'm likely a Lot in my very own story of where I belong and, and, and a relationship with Christ. Sometimes I don't do the very best things. And sometimes I don't say the very best things. And sometimes I don't act in the most appropriate manners. But nonetheless, Lot did get accounted righteousness to him. And when God told him to do things, he did listen. Now, not all the time, but he did have faith in the Lord. And you know, when the Lord asked him to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, he left. Now, maybe the Lord had to drag him out of there kicking and screaming. But I thank God that if that's what it takes during their rapture event, that's what he's going to do. Whether I'm ready to leave this world or not, He's going to catch me up in the clouds in the twinkling of an eye, and I don't have a choice about it. And I thank God for it, because maybe at that time in my life, I might be in love with the world. I might be pretty happy with the way my business is going or the way my family life is going, and maybe I'm not looking forward to that day. And so when I consider Lot in this story, you know, he says, consider Noah and consider Lot. I consider Lot somebody who just didn't really want to leave. He had set up a pretty good home. He was pretty happy with his condition, but God didn't let that stop him from the tribulation period. And so I believe that God would do the same for his whole church. Whether the whole church is ready to leave or not, maybe only half have their bags packed. Maybe only half of the church is looking for them. Only, maybe only half the church is sober. But thank God that this is the kind of example that we have that the other half of the church won't delay the Lord's recovery of his bride. And so he's going to take you, whether you want to go or not. And that's what he did. And you know what? It saved Lot from brimstone and fire, which happened to be very similar to what's going to happen on earth during the tribulation period. Those judgments are very similar. And so at the end of the Philadelphian age, the door is beginning to close. And all over the world, the doors are beginning to close on the church. I want you to know, more and more churches than we have ever seen have begun to close the doors to the gospel message. Is there anybody in here who can remember a time in your life who is older than me that churches so openly welcomed homosexuality? I believe with the welcoming of homosexuality and the welcoming of the transgenderism, and, and then there was another church uh, that had a drag show performance during a worship service. Never have I seen more evidence of the closing of the doors of the church in the face of Christ than I have now. And so I know many of you can't say that. And so as we exited uh, uh, the Philadelphian age, we see that the door is shut, but Christ still stands outside. He's still calling for repentance. He's still asking those who would hear to hear and those who have eyes to see. He's asking them to see, to come and look. And he hasn't given up on them. And I thank God that we're in the long-suffering age of Christ, that the world might still be one, that there might still be another uh, revival age, that there might be another church yet to talk about. 
in this saga of what is our church age. But scripture tells us that there will be a certain point in history when the door is closed. And so in the Philadelphian age, it says that I'm the one who opens the doors and no one can shut. And I am the one who shuts the doors and no one can open. But now as we, as we exited that church age, the very last church we looked at had a fully closed door. And I want you to know when that door is fully closed, that's the signal for the door to fully open into heaven. And that's a good day. And that's a great promise. And so uh, uh, this is an amazing transition in our story and, 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 and an incredible way to get started into the study. And, and I want you to know that God uh, uses the Apostle Paul as a symbol. I mean, the Apostle John is a symbol. And so as Christ stands beyond that open door in his mighty throne room, he shouts out, come here, come here. And John is the representation of the raptured church who gets to walk through the door of heaven into the throne room of God. And so that's the symbolism of we're going for. As the church age is buried, as the church age is over and the door of the church is shut and Christ can no longer coach anybody outside of those uh, establishments that are no longer glorifying Christ, as that last soul is one, Christ decides to retreat to his throne room before he brings judgment on the earth. And then he hollers to his church, come here. And we are raptured. We are ambassadors for Christ in this world. And when our country declares war, first it calls home the ambassadors, right? You ever, you know that about wartime, right, Dad? Whenever there's wartime and there's certain hot areas of our culture and of society, the first ones to come home are the ambassadors. And the world is going to be under siege. And the mighty God is going to mount up a war of which the world has never seen before. And He has commissioned the greatest and mightiest angels you ever did hear about in your life. Angels that terrify men. Men will be begging that stones will fall upon them and crush them. They'll be trying to kill themselves and will not have the power to do so. It says men will fall down in the streets and they'll begin to lacerate themselves in trying to take their own lives. And God said, no, it's not that easy. You have had your chance and now it's my turn. And, but, the, but the great and beautiful promise is the Lord has a plan for his own. And before those judgments come and before the awful hour of visitation of God is upon the earth, first God must take out his enix from the habitation of the earth. And he must provide for his Noahs, that remnant that is left behind, those Jewish people, before he snatches his lots from the fire, before the judgment completely falls down upon the earth, before he calls out and he says, come hither, as your, new, or your King James Bible might say. And, and, and may the Lord encourage us and bless us in the faith to all those who love His appearing and who look for His appearing at His second coming. I want you to know as, I, as you have searched through the Scriptures, this is what I want you to remember. I've been lost in this before. I've been, I've been wrapped up in this before. And, and, and they call it kind of prepping and preppers. And I want you to know when you're reading through the text and it talks about this last day, more than anything else that Christ asks you to look for, you want a sign for the last day? You want to look for a sign? Just look for me. Keep your eyes on me. Be sober. Be watchful. Be vigilant. He ain't saying look for the Antichrist. He will look like this. He'll be wearing this and this is what he'll say. He ain't saying be looking for this. As a matter of fact, if you read Matthew 24, it talks about there will be wars and rumors of wars and there will be earthquakes and there's going to be this and there's going to be that and there's going to be that. Oh yeah, and by the way, that doesn't mean it's tribulation. I'm just telling you, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on and you should just keep your eyes on me and you won't have to worry about all that. And I will protect you and I will take care of you, my faithful ones. And, and you'll be just like Noah if you were left behind. I'll provide an ark that you might still get out of it. And you know what? If you are counted righteous under the blood of Christ, I'll pull you out of there like Enoch. And you know what? If you're that church that is that has fallen in love with the world, yet yeah, you had a redeeming work in you, but yet 
for some reason you just don't want to leave this place, Christ's going to take you anyway and you're going to be grateful about it. Because I promise you this, as Lot was snatched out of Sodom and Gomorrah and was taken away, I, as he felt the heat burning the back of his neck, <laughs> you ever walk too close to a fire and you feel the temperature? As he felt the heat burning the back of his neck, walking away from Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm certain that he had to have been grateful that God had spared his life from that kind of a burning damnation. And so... Uh, then we go on in our text and it says, And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you the things which must take place after this. At the sound of a what do the dead in Christ rise? I wonder if that's coincidental. The sound of a trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we, his prized jewels, his beautiful bride will be prepared and made spotless and without blemish and without wrinkle. And we will go to the marriage feast of the Lamb and we will be made in a perfect glorified state ready to marry the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And while hell on earth is being unloosed and while things are just becoming undone, we will be, like Joel Osteen said, living our best life now except for we really will be living our best life now in the presence of Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and so we get this great invitation to join Christ. And, and as, as I move to close, this is what I want you to understand, okay? All right, so the first thing John does is, is, is he's praying, he's on his knees, he's asking the Lord for help. Who knows what John's asking the Lord, but the Lord comes to him where he's at on his knees. And not only does the Lord come to him, he invites him to a wonderful vision which is Christ standing before the golden lampstands and, and, and the great priest that he is and the high priest that he is and the ruler he is. He shows himself to John as this man. And, and he illustrates the reason why he is that character through the church ages. We move into the next couple of verses. I want you to know we now transition from that image of Christ behind the lampstands tending the churches into a whole nother position. He is now in a throne room where he has prepared a place for us to rule and reign with him. We have transitioned from him standing and tending the church to a place of authority and judgment and he's about to execute with exact precision an assault upon the evil ones and the wicked ones of this world that they will not be able to withstand. And so our text goes on as I close immediately. I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was a, like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their head. And those 24 elders that set around the crown of Christ just represents us, the beautiful church. There were 12 tribes, which were the 12 promised blessed heritage of Israel. And then how many apostles were there? 12. 12 and 12. 24 thrones represents all of God's children will reign and rule with Christ. And, and now we won't go into that throne room to pray for our sick and sick ones. We won't go into that throne room to pray for the lost souls. We won't go into that throne room and ask Him for mercy and forgiveness. We won't go into that throne room and petition God for any of our weakness. But this time, when we go into that throne room, we will reign with Christ, not as His equals, but we will be under Christ and He will give us the authority to make a good work for Him on this planet during the millennial reign. And that's an exciting future to look forward to. Let me close us in prayer. Father, I thank You for the way that chapter 4 has begun and I am so excited looking into this book. I just can't wait to get to the next section and the next section. And, and I'm hungry for Your Word and I love it, Lord. And I thank You for Your uh, revelation to my eyes and to my heart. And I pray, God, that You grow us as a church family. You help us to look at this Scripture and to gain great understandings of it, Lord, because we do need to encourage the world and we do need to be prepared and, and we do need to, 
to reach the world for these events that are coming will just be, oh, they're going to be so miserable for the lost. And then, Father, this makes us, uh, gives us a greater opportunity for outreach if we know the truth of this Scripture and we can understand this Scripture that we might use it as an instrument to win the lost. Father, that's what we need. We need all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.